What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 496. My name is Marshall. I'm one, of your, I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line all the way from four miles away, maybe less, it's Ryan Spain. Ryan, you're back again this week. Welcome, uh, welcome back to LR. I'm back again. Good to be here. Sorry that Luis's voice is still uh, bringing him down, but uh, glad I could be here to help. Yeah, he. Uh, I, I talked to him earlier in the week, and he's like, "Yeah, I should be good to go for the show." He was feeling a lot better. The fever is gone, and you know he was kind of back in action. But then uh, the day before we're recording here, he was like, "Man, I'm I'm really concerned about my voice." Like it was, he said, it was really scratchy, and uh, and wasn't really back yet. And he thought it might go away in the middle of the show. And I said, "Well, you know, you should just take the time that like I don't I don't want to push it, you know." And and he's he's getting ready for big tournaments coming up and stuff too. So I said, uh, I'm going to grab Ryan again. I love having you on the show, Ryan. And, uh, and so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do a little Q and a session with you specifically after we cover kind of a a mini topic. And of course our crack a pack before we get into all of it, channelfireball.com sponsor of this podcast. That is place to go for all things magic related on the internet. If you need uh, if you need sealed product, like say modern horizons, which Ryan and I talked about, last week and i've got a chance to play well quite a bit of i played a sealed played a bunch of matches with that and i've done i guess three drafts now so uh you know starting to get a better feel for the format and uh if you want to pick that up you can do so at channel fireball also you can get supplies sleeves all that kind of stuff over at uh at cfb and while you're there check out the awesome free content right on the front page of their site they've got uh, articles podcasts uh, videos from some of the best players and content producers in magic and it's all free right there on the front page of the site so please do check them out channelfireball.com also the patreon patreon.com slash limited resources is where you can go to support the show directly uh one of the cool perks that you get for being a patron any level of patron by the way is you get access to the patreon feed which is where i'll put questions uh for example i put up a feedback thread about the preset primer shows to make sure that these were still uh, where we wanted them to be and fulfilling the needs of our listeners. And I got some great feedback from our patrons there. And then also uh, for questions and such. So for example, uh, I've got Ryan on the show and I wanted to kind of, last week we were dialed into our our topic and didn't really have any time uh, for for Ryan specific stuff. But, you know, Ryan worked at Wizards of the Coast for what, seven, eight years. You uh, worked in R&D, you worked on Magic Online, you worked on Arena, you did a whole bunch of different stuff. And so uh, I opened up the questions for Ryan. So we're going to get a chance to to kind of uh, find out what it's like to have worked there and what Ryan learned and made and all that kind of stuff. And those questions came from our patrons right on that uh, on, on the patreon.com slash limited resources. So if you want to become one, if this show makes you happy, helps you uh, get through your day, helps you improve at magic, maybe wins you a few booster packs here or there, that's the way you can give back. Uh, it's uh, any level you want. You can quit any time. There's no like commitment or anything like that. And, uh, and rest assured, the store, the the show will remain free if that is not an option for you at this time. We totally understand, and it is not a problem. But if you do want to support the show, that's the way to do it. Okay, um, let's do a crack a pack, right? You you've been playing tons of uh, War of the Spark on your stream, right? I mean, it's yeah, pretty much draft, nonstop. basically nonstop war. Uh, we took we'll we'll play uh, returning formats if it catches our fancy. There was a lot of Dominaria played, for example, but it has been a heavy diet of War of the Spark, but also, let's keep in mind, it's been a heavy diet of Arena War of the Spark. I bet most mm. listeners have drafted this format more than I have authentically, mm-hmm. a hundred, with, yeah. a hundred, with 100% authenticity. Not mm-hmm. that Arena isn't fun, awesome, and totally worth it, and, a, and I think a great drafting experience despite the lack of humans. It would be greater if we had humans, but this a lot of my perspective is going to be bought... Um, influenced i think so i want you to temper me on that make sure you know that i'm okay. uh, uh not just arena blind okay well rocket rocket's going to keep you in check if i don't so that's, that's right uh, both of us uh first card out is he's going to keep somebody in the backyard and check yeah <laughs> Some, somebody has the audacity to be walking past our house right now i'm sure yeah so. well that was uh that's on them not on rocket he's just doing exactly. his job uh honor the god pharaoh is our first card. Where are you at on, on Honor the God Pharaoh? Uh, definitely up from where I was at the beginning of the format. It's not amazing uh, from a bot standpoint. They tend to let it wheel a lot. So that's something I keep in mind when I see it. If I'm falling into a blue-red, for example, or maybe I mm-hmm. take something as awesome as 
Rouse outburst, pack one, pick one, and then uh, see that there's an honor in the pack. I, I, it makes me love that rouse outburst even more because I think there's a good chance I'm getting that honor back. Mm. It's amazing what Amass does for all of these spells in the set. Uh, yeah, these, these spells that if you, if you took the Amass off, we would be very down on them. We'd be very whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. can you imagine playing Honor of the God Pharaoh without Amass? It no, just not at all. And, and, you know, another good example is. Uh, is Toll the Invasion, a card that we normally would have very mediocre to sideboardish, and it's a card that I'm actually quite happy to play. Callous Dismissal? Yeah. Uh, totally. Sorcery Speed Bounce that for yeah. two? Like, that's yeah. just not something you play no. uh, under normal circumstances, and now it's arguably the best blue common, question mark? You know, there's... Yep. The, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next is Rising Populous. That's the two and a white, two, two, whenever another creature or planeswalker you control dies, it gets a counter. I'm pretty off of anything white in the commons for early Same. picks. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, even, I'll get into white based on uncommons and rares, but basically there's not a common that's going to get me into white early. Stealth mission. Never really found its home. Um, not a big fan. Nah, not really. I mean, it does things. It's not that it's bad card. But you it's look just to wield easily, that. easily replaceable. Yeah, yeah, easily replaceable. You can slot it in and it's not embarrassing, but it operates more like an aura than any, anything else. And I... Yeah. Try not to play those, so. Right. Uh, Vivian's Grizzly. This card proved to be a bit too slow. Yeah, it fell. I, I liked that it was a mana sink, and I still will play one in a green deck, but I really don't want any more than one because they are truly useless in pairs, and you really only want this when you can dump mana into it or when you're just trying to hold the fort against aggressive decks. Yeah. Um, Spark Reaper. This one actually ended up being quite a bit better for some reason. Uh yeah, Spark Reaper's uh, fine, and I will always want one in my black decks, regardless of the amass potential. But given black has so much amass, you are tending to have a lot of incidental bodies to sacrifice. And I was saying early on, I felt that the trick with these with amass was going to be leveraging val one ones for value, not mm -hmm. necessarily making a huge army. It turns out it's been kind of both. You can go either way with it, but I really do like the spit out an army, sack it for value, and then do it again type thing. Yeah, player. it does feel like you're getting more value off of each amass rather than just... I mean, because the a second amass for one is literally just a plus one, plus one counter on your small creature, right? Yeah. Where if it creates an entire creature that didn't exist before, it's much stronger. I will uh, say that mm -hmm. uh, it has fallen a little for me, though. The, the, the three mana is a lot to keep up. You can't really keep up mana for the Spark Reaper in the developing stage, it becomes pretty powerful late when you leave three up almost naturally turn by turn. And then suddenly all of their removal is uh, a, a bounce, you know, a, a, sorry, a cantrip for you. You know, you yeah, get to at least draw yeah. something. Uh -huh. That's when it gets really powerful. I find it hard to just uh, do the pick off small things for value when you're trying to build out your board. So anyway, yeah, it's, it, it, it's yeah. hard to keep up. The, right. And of course, none of these are really first pickable cards. Right. Uh, you know, just to put it in context, totally lost is next. I want to wheel those, but I like to have one or two in my yeah. blue, blue red decks, especially. That's playable. Um, all right. Well, our best card so far is a white card. It's La Rune Enforcer. Yeah, that's definitely better than the populous and mm -hmm. if there were a white common that i were going to first pick out of a pack it would be this one but everything else would have to be pretty miserable how about burning profit do you take that over law rune enforcer yeah actually from a from a color preference standpoint i would i recognize that law rune enforcer is abstractly the most power the more powerful card but the uh, uh you know one three scry on spells uh, and get bigger it just all is a nice little package for mm -hmm. what I think is one of the more powerful decks in the format, the the yeah. red blue spells, especially on a, on arena, as you mentioned, uh, yeah. relentless advance. I really thought this card would find a home in that red, red blue spells deck. Um, but it doesn't, it, I, I've been much happier just not having it in my deck. Uh, yeah. It's trying general. to be a synergy hill giant for some of the strategies in the format, but you just get too punished with things like callous dismissal and yeah. totally lost in the format. You just, Yep. It's fine if you get end up, end up with a 3-3 army off of a bunch of incidental tack-ons to, to actual spells, but 
when you're giving up a whole card, it's just too much risk to put it into a token like that. Yeah. Uh, Centaur Nurture is our last common. That's the mana producer. I thought I was going to like that more than I did, but I'm you're just not ramping from four to six that much. I mm -hmm. consider it uh, uh, perfectly playable. It's not bad. Mm -hmm. It's just that I value almost every other green color fixer uh, significantly higher. I would... Mm -hmm. I'd rather have, there's the uncommon uh, Hexproof 2-1. Mm -hmm. There's the uh, Horizons. Um, new Horizons, which, yeah. Yeah, New Horizons Aura that I like a lot better. And uh, Globe. I, I, I'd rather even have the Guild Globe. Yeah, um, same. So it, it makes the cut if that's exactly what I need to make my splash work or whatever. But I hope to pick up those late. All right, well, let's take a look at our uncommons. First one is Rally of Wings. That's the one in a white instant untap. All creatures you control and creatures with flying get plus two, plus two until end of turn. Never played it, never seen nope. it played. Yeah, I think I saw it played once. And it was really good, as you might imagine. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> the it's... deck that actually wants it is <laughs> insane. Uh, what about Teo the Shield Mage? Mm, not really what I wanting, want to be doing, although Teo protects other Planeswalkers pretty well. Mm -hmm. If you end up in a deck where you're trying to protect Planeswalkers to get amazing value out of them, this can be a playable. But again, it's also white. You know, I just not it's not where I want to be. Yeah. How about Eternal Skylord? Now, that's where you want to be. That is uh, number one with a bullet now in this pack, for sure. Mm -hmm. I couldn't mm -hmm. can't even remember what what our <laughs> front runner was before. I mean, our front runner like was... Um, <clears throat> was either Law Rune Enforcer or <laughs> Burning Prophet or Totally Lost. I mean, All right. really bad. Yeah, well, I so love uh, I love the Aven. I love the Skylord because it's in blue and blue has card drawing, which makes me happy. Yeah, and it's just so powerful. You know, getting two creatures, including a flyer for five mana. This card looked amazing the first time I saw it, and it has never disappointed. It's exactly what I want. Yeah. What about the rare, though? It's Roll Reversal. This is the blue-blue-red sorcery. Exchange control of two target permanents that share a permanent type. Swingy card. I have seen this card be extremely powerful. In fact, game-swingingly so. Um, also, I've seen it be outright you don't want to cast it because <laughs> you're right. just ahead, you know. <laughs> this is another great use of 1-1 uh, army tokens for sure. Yep. And yep. I think the uh, the Aven is better. So if you're going for just uh, the deck quality, I, I would rather have the, the mono Sky blue card. Mm -hmm. The Skylord is, is, is one color for one thing. And I do think it's a, you know, the, uh, some, some listeners may feel we're uh, too pro blue on this show in general. Uh, like all the hosts historically have loved blue mm -hmm. in, in limited, but it's like they keep making it good. <laughs> You know, you you add yeah. uh, card card draw plus evasion, and really, I want uh, I want to try and go long and have my bet superior decisions matter more. So blue just ends up frequently being a great place place to be. Uh, so while the rare is good, I think for win percentage, you want to take the Aven the the Skylord here. Um, yeah. And then, but I did want to mention because this comes up on my stream a lot. We play primarily on a free to play account where we've only spent five bucks for the welcome bundle and everything else is just what we grind week to week. And that was we, starting what back in uh, November, November? Yeah, like, no, November of last you year. You haven't put money onto that account outside of that first five bucks. No. And we play, well, we play, you know, five drafts a week because it, it, it would be easy to not put money in if I only drafted once a week or whatever. So the question is how much drafting are you getting? Right. Yeah. But of the, course. uh, where I'm going with this is that they introduced in one of the updates in the last few months. I think they, I think I talked about this on the previous run when I was on the show earlier this year, but you can grind, you can grind gems. Uh, you can rare draft for gems in limited now. And it's a thing mm -hmm. they added basically as part of the protection against fifth copies of a rare mythic, such that if you have, um, you know, four copies of uh, Rao in your, pool mm -hmm. already and you open a fifth one you can take it and you get is uh, he's rare right so you get 20 gems you, anyway you get 20 gems for your fifth copy of a rare that you draft and f uh, 40 for your fifth copy of a mythic that you draft and this is regardless of the number of whether, whether you have 4x of the entire set or not right you get this mm -hmm. even if you're way off of completing the set so you can actually use wild cards uh to to go and you can leave a draft mid draft on arena go craft 
four wild cards of the card that you're about to draft that's a rare or mythic, go finish your draft and you'll get gems for it. So yep. if you're only onto arena for drafting, uh, you can use this trick to you spend wild cards to fill in your holes in rares and mythics to, to actually get gems out of your rare drafting. So because of that, it's a factor that we actually consider on stream. So this is a place where I would actually be taking uh, on stream. I would for the free to play account, I would take the rare. It's uh, it's not mm. much worse than the Skylord mm -hmm. uh, in, ter in terms of its potential power level. It's less flexible because it's two colors. But in general, if I'm in blue, I, I'm really hoping to be blue red at this point anyway. And it effectively is it's not exactly 20 gems because you need to take you need to get four of them before they start becoming gems. So you, you have those first four that you need to get. But every rare, if you're going to eventually get 4x of everything, is some number of gems. And so the question that I have as a, a person trying to play the economy as well as the game is ask myself, what's better for my gem count? Uh, this Skylord and a slight bump in win percentage or uh, this rare that gives me a straight up gem cash right now and maybe lowers my win percentage a tiny, tiny bit. Like what's mm -hmm. correct. And mm -hmm. so we get into a lot of discussions about where the line should be. And I'm kind of at a point where uh, I'm generally pack one, pick one. I'm almost always taking the rare mythic because you don't know what colors you're in yet. So the mm -hmm. chances, the, the the expected value of that Skylord pick is a lot lower pack one, pick one, because you may get a, you, you just may get completely taken off of blue from, from there. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, once I'm known what colors I'm in though, I'm, generally not going to take rares over um, powerful synergy uncommons. Like uh, if I am red blue, for example, and there's a uh, help me out with the name, the uh, cast a non-creature spell proliferate uh, two, two for three. Uh, what card is it? Uh, blue two and a blue for a two, two. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell proliferate. Oh, oh yeah. The flux, flux, channel. flux channeler. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like if I'm in blue, red, a flux channeler is going to be worth, more, I think, to my long-term gems for that event than any random rare I'm not going to play just because the Flux Channeler, when it does land and stick, does mm -hmm. win games on its own and is that powerful. Mm -hmm. But if it's a, if it's just a good creature or just even just a removal spell, unless I really need those things to make the deck cohesive, I'm going to go ahead and take gems in general. So. Let's a little okay. aside on, on the rare. So I yeah, think for power level, great, we're taking the Skylord. But uh, if you're on arena cons and if you're on arena and you're going to be willing to do the wild card trick to generate some gems or you're going to 4x the set before the end of the format, you can start to take into account the gem grind that comes from rare drafting on arena. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, Ryan's on Twitch, twitch.tv slash going optimal. Uh, and as you can see, he knows how to go optimal on arena and he can teach you to do the same thing uh, by following his stream. He, of course, you can ask questions in the chat or just see how he does it and then mimic that. And I mean, look, if you're on a tight budget, arena is really a godsend for this stuff. I and mean, he just told you he's put in five dollars in November and he's drafting, you know, five times a week. Draft. And I have a com I have a complete set of RNA. Uh, we'll have a complete mm -hmm. set of War soon, and um, the only reason I don't have a complete set of GRN is that it was the set in progress when I started streaming. Yeah, I mean that's incredible. So again, that's uh, you know the caveat, of course, to what he's saying is is that, that that's if you're limited only on Arena because those wild cards, you know, you're basically cashing them in for gems, which you can turn into more drafts. But if those wild cards have a lot of value to you, if you're trying to build a constructed deck or something, then you won't have that flexibility. You can still work it, but you won't be able to do it quite to the to the level that. And really, it's just about when of. because you know I'm going to have every yeah card and standard in two years. I should have every card and standard except the current set. Right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you get there eventually. It's just the way I approach it. It doesn't prioritize getting exactly the rares and mythics from the new set that I want right away. Right away. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, so let's get into our we've got kind of a mini topic to, to hit up that you and I had kind of been ping ponging back and forth here. And let's let's get into it. Basically, uh, one of our the, I was reading through the questions that our patrons posted for for Ryan and it fit the description of what we were going to talk about anyway. So I kind of sniped this question. This one comes from Alyssa Blair, who says, how to not tilt when you had a bad draft and you know your deck is an 03, how to get wins out of bad decks. And, you know, specifically talking about the not tilt 
part when something goes wrong, whether you just drafted a stinker or maybe, you know, the times when I think people tilt off the most is when they think they have a really good deck and then it doesn't perform. They, they oh, lose, yeah. they play badly or they run bad and, uh, and then they don't win. I, you know, I think that where's the justice Marshall. Yes. That is the question that you often uh, hear people ask in some form or another. And there's kind of a lot going on, uh, you know, when it comes to this type of question, because of course here, here on LR, you know, we're nuts and bolts spikes, right? We're, we're the type of players who value the, uh, analyze you know analyzing improvement uh you know we focus on our plays not on what happens process at the end. oriented mm -hmm. process Trust the oriented. process that's right and that does though lead to some interesting situations because being human beings flawed as we are uh we will still tilt right it still it still sucks to lose even if you understand the concepts underneath it although i will say that at least for me it definitely helps uh, it helped me, especially for poker stuff, to not tilt uh, after having sort of earned, you know, a, a, a good grasp on the underlying concepts of some of this stuff. And what it really came down to for me, and, and I want your take on this, Rye, was expectations management. Um, for me, you know, it really took me kind of losing a lot, which is to which is how it works, right? You just do. I mean, it's it's the same thing in magic and in poker. Like, you know, the the stat that we always like to throw around, but it's a hundred percent true is the best players in the world at the pro tour level, you know, they'll win something like, you know, low to mid sixties percent. Right. That's that's your that's your Luis's, your Finkels, right? Like the the goats, right? right. And we're and, and these guys are winning less than two thirds of their matches, right? Now that's an impressive number when you put it into context, especially when you look at some players who you think are quite good and you look at their pro tour records and you're like, oh, they're, they're only winning like 55% of their matches, right? And, and so, but you understand then of course, that if, if I'm only 60 something percent and I'm one of the best players ever to play the game and I'm gonna sit down, I'm losing one out of three on average. And it is not uncommon at all for that one out of three to become three out of three, right? That happens all the time um, where you can lose three times in a row or four times in a row easily. Um, you know, and that's not even that unlikely um, if your win percentage is that high. And I got bad news for <laughs> not only the two co-hosts here today, but everybody else on the show that are, li listens to the show. Um, good day to bring this up when Luis isn't here is that, you know, our win percentage isn't that high either. Right. Uh, you know, th those guys are significantly better than us at magic, uh, depending on what level of development we're at. They could be way, way better than us all the way up to just simply better than us. Um, but that, of course, means that we're going to be losing even more than that. The weird part is, is trying to separate it out in your head. Right. Because like I could tell you that yet it still feels bad when you lose. Right. And that's the, the gap for me. That's the hard part is that like, you can listen to the show and understand and still tilt off, even though it's illogical, right? It doesn't actually totally. make sense at that point. Cause it's like, well, you willingly entered this tournament. You knew that your win percentage was, let's say your win percentage is 58, right? That that's what you went on average, which is decent. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's okay. Right. That's great. Yeah. yeah, you know, and somebody's got to be the, the losing side of that equation. So, you know, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you have a yeah, and you have a small edge here, right? You know, you're, you're pushing your 8% edge match after match. Now, over the long term, that actually adds up a lot. It really does. And you if you keep applying that edge repeatedly, you'll find yourself, uh, you know, the benefit, uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of benefits from that, you'll be winning, you'll win tournaments eventually. That kind of thing. But boy, the real focus comes down to any individual match, game, or even tournament is just a tiny sample size. And when you're only dealing with percentages that range from, you know, hopefully mid fifties to, to mid sixties or something. And I should mention as an aside that, you know, of course, that's the win percentage for the players at the pro tour or mythic championship level. But if right. you're playing at a GP, their percentage is a bit higher. If they're playing on arena, their percentage is higher, you know, uh, local store, their percentage is going to be way higher. Uh, you can actually get it quite high, you know, depending on your level of competition. So keep that in mind, but still, you know, again, especially for a podcast, you know, about getting better at the game, a lot of us aren't where we're going to be yet. We're still on that journey. And this, you know, listening to the show is part of that, but you would expect to sit down and lose a fair bit of the time yet. Right for whatever reason it bothers us. And I don't know why I, it's just a human thing, I guess. Well, it's, 
I find the interesting part of this or one of the interesting parts of this thought process to be around why we do this and what fun is and how mm -hmm. like you can tell yourself what you know don't take that so serious like why are you letting losing a game of magic affect you so much but if you if it didn't affect you at all why are you playing magic at all right so mm -hmm. it's this balance mm -hmm. between yeah i tilt because i care and why would i even bother with this hobby if i didn't care mm -hmm. and so it's about finding this finding ways to care and finding ways to enjoy your hobby and find that fun while being more rational about tilt and getting your mindset in a place where you can uh, be steeled up and, and hardened against the impact of the, the frustrating losses that inevitably come with this game. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. Yeah. For me, it's been amazing to, to stream because it's helped me with my tilt a lot. Uh, let me tell you, you can't, just be a big baby on on stream and have that come across <laughs> very uh, right. very well, you know. And I, but it's again, it's an interesting line. People want to see me care as well, and I'm not never going to lie with my emotions, but I can modulate. You know, I it, when I'm mm -hmm. feeling that tilt, I can either apply some dampening and apply some control, or I can just embrace it. You know, if I, sure, <laughs> if people, I want to, do like to watch people yeah, tilt off. If it's I just want to, just like yeah, okay, let's tilt, let's go full blown monkey tilt and just. Ah, you know, because mm -hmm. there is a, in that way, it, it is stress relieving. It is feels yeah. good to just be mad when something has made you mad. Yeah. But but we're here for fun. So, like, it can't be that healthy to to do that to yourself, to beat yourself up over those kinds of things. But you can have a healthy relationship with the frustrations of of magic, both in. I think job one is. Remembering the mantra about uh, control, you know, and about um, basically the, you know, you need to, oh, let's see, it's the, there's a Alcoholics Anonymous uses it. It's like, um, oh, yeah, uh, the embrace know, the things and all that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that you want to mm -hmm. uh, um, have the wisdom to the wisdom to know the difference. The, oh, shoot, I wish now I'm butchering that phrase, but basically it's like um, know what you can control, control the stuff you can control. And don't sweat the stuff you can't control, right? Like the, the biggest waste of time is when you give yourself emotional agony over uh, simple variants, over the fact that, uh, yeah, here's this game we signed up for that sometimes feeds you seven lands in a row. And you don't have to be numb to that. It's frustrating, right? But you can also be like, ah, like just let it out and be done. And again, to get back to process orientation, what could you have done about that? When mm -hmm. there's, when there's nothing you could have done about it, that should let you off the hook a little bit. Oh, and it's for real, sure. it's really frustrating to lose to the card. You don't think is particularly playable. You know, that's, that's the worst part. Your, your opponent goes, curves out, um, one, one haste life link into <laughs> zero four scry wall into, you know, uh, like whatever, just stuff that, people who listen to this show are not going to be main decking because they're paying attention, but you can still lose to those cards. It doesn't matter if you mulligan to seven and got stuck on two and then drew nothing, but your mulligan five to drops. seven, it would be pretty Sorry, sweet. Mulligan. Well, we're, we're going to be doing that soon. Mulligan, yeah. uh, you, uh, mulligan to seven. You know what I mean? Mulligan to six, mulligan to five. Anyway, you're, you're just mm -hmm. out of it. Um, I'm needing to find, really taking a moment in those spots to remind myself that, oh, these are one of those random losses I take, you know, uh, literally everybody takes these and it doesn't matter what spells are in my opponent's deck. They can be, as long as they're playing creatures of some kind, they're going to beat mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And what, well, what, what can I learn from that? There's almost nothing you can learn from that other than magic is a harsh mistress, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, but it just sucks because then it's just the answer becomes, well, then just suck it up and move on. And that's just not satisfying, right? It isn't. It, it feels as if there has been an injustice perpetrated upon you. But you can ask yourself, what can I learn from this? Mm -hmm. Anytime you're mad, seek a lesson. And when you realize that there isn't a lesson, maybe it'll help you get over that sooner. Um that's so that's one one way to think about that. Uh, 
the most important places I get frustrated are the ones where I do have lessons, where where I'm realizing this is something I need to learn from. And one of the reasons we're talking about this now is because I had a I had a kind of a weird week on stream so far, where on like Tuesday I played twice, drafted what I thought was a pretty outstanding deck. You know, we talk after I draft a deck, we'll talk about par, you know, how many wins we might expect from this deck. And it's a dangerous game because we talk about expectation setting, but you can also set your expectations too high or you set, you can set your expectations reasonably, but when then, Mm -hmm. when they miss because of variance or whatever, you can feel even worse because you're so far off from your expectations. Totally. So we had pretty high expectations for this first deck and it's a best of one. And we went two, three done and Mm -hmm. it was kind of stinky. And the, the, uh, the, the mana wasn't just didn't show up, whatever. It was, uh, we didn't win. We played again. This deck was significantly worse, but still solid. We still had, had good, good feelings about it. Another two, three. And it was kind of a Oof. disappointing, kind of a disappointing day for me, uh, given the quality of the decks that I felt I had. But here's the thing. People ask me what what are you surprised about with streaming? What has been most surprising to you about streaming, and or the thing that I didn't expect the most, and the thing that I didn't expect is just how much value I was going to get from having many dozen sharp Magic players watching my every move, excitedly mm. pouncing on any mistake that I make. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now that might sound like torture to you. That might sound like, ugh, that's hard. And sometimes it is, you know, your pride takes some some blows when you stream for sure. But I would pay to have a team of people assessing every move I make in magic and letting, yeah, me, know, yeah, letting me know when I screw up. <laughs> and they're also generally good. Like the, the combined brain power, the hive mind of chat is strong enough that I feel like most stuff gets caught. And the number of things that I've been called on that I didn't even notice, I just didn't even notice. And then through chat was able to recognize a mistake and process that and say, Oh, like I've been talking a lot about how like a common mistake path I go down is uh, board control obsession, board state obsession, mm-hmm. where I'm so in the mindset of finding the play that increases my board control and decreases theirs because that so often leads to victory. That's like my primary mode of thinking, control mm-hmm. the board, control the board. And then I'll look up and see that I missed lethal. Uh, oh, you know, chat sure. screaming at me because I missed lethal. If I, why are you controlling the board? Just win, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. those are times, there are times that I've done that where uh, I'm not sure I would have seen it before the end of the game. Like I win on the next turn or whatever because it worked out. And, and I don't even notice that uh, I forgot to look for lethal or whatever. And so that's been a, a great benefit. Uh, and what, but, so to get back to my week, though, I I was disappointed with that day, but, we, you know, we track punts. You know, if uh, if I mm-hmm. make a mistake, the chat will type exclamation point punt, and if enough people do, it's officially a punt, right? Mm-hmm. No punts. I got, mm-hmm. I, I've got some viewers in particular, you know who you are, I'm sure they're listening, uh, who are eager, just incredibly eager to uh, call me out on punts and even campaign for it among the rest of the chat, you know, <laughs> they want to uh, snap you off as right. soon as possible. Right. That's brutal. But I love it because, um, he didn't have anything. Right. So I, I went two, three, two, three, and nobody had anything for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not going to say I played perfect magic, but when nobody in chat can really call me on anything, except I think maybe I forgot that a jo- I had a Johnny great heart or whatever and, and forgot that my creatures had vigilance. And so there you go. There's like another thing I've learned is that, wow, I continue to miss Planeswalker passives. Uh, it's still it's still not done. <laughs> yep. I think I'm going to be doing yep. it for the rest of this format. Easily my number one uh, mistake in the format is forgetting a Planeswalker uh, static is it officially static or passive? Or, yeah, we call we call them statics. I, static. don't, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I'll call it static. Maybe that's more official. Anyway, so the, the yeah, so forgetting planeswalker statics is a big a big leak of mine, as we call it. It's kind of a poker term when you recognize that there's a hole in your game that your win percentage would go up if you could plug it. And so yeah, having uh, having chat call all this out has been great. So then I, anyway, so so yeah, I had a disappointing day, but no punts. Then yesterday. 
did something for the first time ever. I started O2 in a best of three. And then I, I'm sorry, best of one. And then rattled off seven straight wins. Ooh. It was pretty Ooh. sweet. Like the full the, run back. Huh? The full nice. run back. Every single one of our seven wins was us facing elimination. And we mm-hmm. won all seven of them. And it felt Dude, amazing. That is gr- nice. Yeah, it was a great run. Um, I put all of my uh, drafts up on YouTube. So if you want to uh, go to my YouTube channel, that one was called, uh, let's see, look it up. This is a good one. Uh, if you oh, if you it, send me the link, I, I'd be happy to put that link that that direct link in the notes. If you yeah, want. I can do that uh, right now. I'm getting a shareable link, and I'll pop it in the show notes at the at the top. But yeah, it was called the Tamio Plan, and um, so it was great. It was totally worth watching. But you're going to see some um, some just dumbfounding punts along the way, <laughs> including <laughs> in these including in the matches where we were up against it, including basically elimination matches where I had multiple times where uh i had i had got called out on punts and some different than others and so i wanted to talk about um the fact that you know your results don't always dictate your quality of play i think my quality of play was better in my two two threes than it was in my seven two yeah uh and so to to not get hung up on the results you know we talk about decisions not results and this is really one of the, one of the hearts of it is that your your job is a nuts and bolts spike is to focus on process, focus on decisions. And we talk about it all the time on the show. Every co-host has, but it's so important. And, and if you can get into that mindset, it is a tilt prevention system because when you can feel the tilt setting in and then ask yourself, well, what was my mistake? What's my learning point? What am I taking away from this? Where can I improve? What is my leak that I can plug that is the source of this frustration I'm feeling? And I find that when... The answer is, oh, there isn't one. I just drew seven straight lands and I got a nice fat loss because of it. And it doesn't feel fair, but it is. It's, it's going to happen versus, mm-hmm. oh, I'm continuing to forget planeswalker statics or, oh, I need to. What can I do to remind to, to do I need to have a develop a habit of even just checking life totals as I draw cards? You know, what do I do to help with my problem of over focusing on board control? and missing some lethals, you know, and when you get into a mindset of, oh, there's things I can learn and take away and get better at, you replace your stress and your tilt with motivation towards improvement with a definitive plan. Here's something I can work on. Or you you hopefully successfully remind yourself that why are you tilting over something over which you had literally zero control? Mm -hmm. You, You made no mistakes here. You just had a shuffled deck. So lighten up, you know? Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, so that's the, th- those are keys. And, you know, maintaining, managing this tilt is also huge because sometimes, you know, we, we tend to be talking about post-game tilt. I lost that game and I'm mad. But what about mid-game tilt? It's almost more important. Um, oh, yeah, because that'll lead to losses. Yeah. Yeah. Compounding your mistakes with more mistakes uh, it's amazing how people are willing to intentionally make a mistake after making a they they accidentally make a mistake, and then if they make the correct play, it will let the opponent know that they made a mistake, and so they'll make a second mistake to hide their first mistake. I know Luis and you have talked about on this on the show uh, even fairly recently, um, and it's a uh, uh, really a dangerous place to be with your with your mindset. Um, and, uh, sorry, I got a little distracted. My daughter texted me. Um, Oh, no worries. But, uh, so, uh, anyway, when that happens to you mid game, you can, you're just lowering your win win percentage even more. And, uh, even worse. So there's one, there's the one thing of trying to hide, hide your shame with a subsequent mistake. But I see this a lot on arena, even worse, just shame scooping. We had a, oh, yeah. We we had a game we had a game the other day where someone flew their uh one one proliferate white flyer. You know, the one one fl- white flyer doesn't matter, whatever. What one one white flyer, they uh-huh. flew it they flew it right into my reach ogre. Which which I have done. By the I've way, done, that's happened countless times in this format. I have done I have done it personally twice. I think I'm done attacking into Reach Ogre. I'm not sure. It'll probably happen tomorrow now that I <laughs> Now that I've told this story on stream or whatever, um, but my opponent snap scooped and it was like 
so not over. It was so far from over. And I'm wondering about, you know, I hope you limited resources listeners have a better mental fortitude than that to just abandon a game out of shame. Um, and I, so I hope I don't need to really, you know, push that lesson. I think everybody here knows, no, you got to play to your outs or whatever, but also recovering mentally in that moment in that feeling of shame, you can start obsessing on it or you tell yourself well, the game's not recoverable now. Like uh, I think people justify the scoops there is, well, I can't win. You know, now I can't win. I've thrown away a card who can win mm -hmm. after they've thrown away a card, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the answer is you. You can win after you've thrown away a card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so don't uh, do that. And I've done because yeah. one of those exact. So I had a shame scoop after that attack. I have done that exact same attack and recovered to win. And to and to get back to my to my weird seven two victory run, I had the worst punt, the worst type of punt I think you can do, which is the board was granted very complex. But I was debating between a couple of lines and uh, the rope was starting and I and, and I thought I had it figured out. And then I changed my mind and I tried to redo the thing I was going to do. And then suddenly I had zero hourglasses and the rope completes and my turn is passed for me with uh, nothing, wow. nothing. I didn't wow. figure out there's line number one versus line number two. At least take a line. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I didn't take any line at all. I just passed the turn. I'm just like, time walk, go ahead. And brutal, um, brutal. Yeah. And that's a shame scoop moment for a lot of people. A lot of people are just going to give up on the game at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I took a look at the situation. I said, okay, that was obviously really bad. The, the punts were flying. You <laughs> know, I got to see the punt emote uh, that one, that time. Yeah. But we won. We uh, oh. we we bore down, untapped, looked at our lines, looked at our outs, came up with our plan, and enacted the plan, and it worked, and we won. You know, so please don't shame scoop, and also you got to put it past you even when you don't shame scoop. Reassess that board. It doesn't matter how that bird got into that graveyard. Here's the board. Here's the board state. What are you going to do about it? To me. Uh, it reminds me of uh, the pitcher mindset in Major League Baseball where, you know, it's a rough job as a pitcher. You throw a ball and a batter, you know, knocks it out of the park, just a humiliating grand slam or whatever. But you're not done. You got to pitch again. What, what are you going to do for your next pitch? Are you going to um, are you going to be dwelling about the mistake that you just did to give up that grand slam? Or are you going to figure out how to next uh, what the next pitch is going to be? And you got to focus right. on your next pitch, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And that's um, so <clears throat> when you make those in-game mistakes, process them. But then you got to just immediately put it behind you and don't shame scoop. Don't obsess. Don't dwell. Reassess your board state and come up with your new plan. Because if there's anything, you know, I think one of the best lessons of limited resources that anybody can take away uh, for improving their limited game, it's to always have a plan at every step of the way from pack one, pick one to your final victory or your final defeat, your final decision, you have to have a plan. And plans are the things that recover you from tilt. Uh, tilt is wild emotion, I'm angry. A plan is action. A plan is the comfort of knowing yep. what you're trying to do and how you're trying to get there. I recommend if you are playing digitally using some tools like MTGA, MTGA Tracker or other uh, uh, third-party tools that allow you to see what's left in your deck, because a lot of my on on stream planning is based on taking a look at the what's left in my deck and asking myself what solves the current problem I'm facing. So mm -hmm. uh, having a plan and updating your plan and updating your plan in the face of your ridiculous catastrophic mistake uh, is also important. And then your mistakes, uh, mistakes are not all created equal. I made another punt shortly after, but it was because I picked the worst of two lines. But I picked one. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't let it go to freaking clock. And we right. won that game, too. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it's been an interesting week for me on uh, in terms of internalizing and processing these lessons that we speak of again and again on this show. And oh, so I thought great. it was a good time to come around. No, and, totally. And, and you said, <laughs> yeah, being on stream really does put it front and center for you. By the way, I, I did find that it's called the uh, Serenity Prayer. Thank you. Yeah. Read us the serenity prayer. Yeah. So apparently it is to God. I don't know how important that part is, but in, it says. Uh, well, I'll say that in, uh -huh. in, in AA, uh, you can 
God is considered your higher power and you don't need to even be religious. You can, uh, ah, your, your higher power is whatever, you know, there was one guy who's like, whose higher power was, uh, his favorite baseball player, you know, just like wh okay. whoever you want to pray to, <laughs> right. you know, so Edgar whoever Martinez. you're looking to for support. <laughs> <laughs> so Edgar Martinez, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. There you go. So that's you a, go. that's a life lesson from AA that everybody should take with them. And yeah, that is it a, works for magic. It works for life. You control what you can and you accept the things you can't. That's right. Okay. Let's get into these questions, right? Because I want to try to get through as many of these as we can in sure the thing. time frame that we've got. Um, <laughs> first one comes from our old buddy, Scalding Hot Soup, who says, Hey, Marshall. Hey, Ryan. Uh, missing Luis, but glad to have Ryan back again. I'm not sure how long we've gone without hearing a Luis pun, but we have had, uh, had to have set some sort of record already. Here's a question for Ryan. What's an example of a card you had a difficult time designing? And what's an example of a card that seems to have designed itself? Well, I am not, uh, I don't have that much card design under my belt in terms of cards that I can point at and say, those are mine. My role in Wizards R&D was heavily digital. I think of, think of me as a starting out in R&D as a digital liaison, helping process between paper and digital so that the user experience of Magic Online was uh, superior, was was better. And I did get myself onto design teams, though. So I have um, I have a handful of cards uh, that I that I can point to and say this was mine. And I've been a lot on, on sets, though. You, you end up with your finger in a lot of pies, but it's tough to get one. That you can say, yep, that's mine. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, the uh, a challenging one of mine was uh, Chromanticore. Uh, Chromanticore is a Wooberg card. It's, uh, you know, all five colors. And then it's, uh, I think it's printed form. This is where it's challenging. It's a 4-4. A, a four -four. Now, the mechanic, we called it in design uh, imbue. I can't even remember what the printed version was. What, uh, the bestow. It's bestow. Right? bestow yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bestow. So Chromanticore has bestow, which means you can cast it as an aura for a little bit more, or you can cast it as a creature. And basically, it's a 4-4 four -four Flying, lifelink, trample, uh, and this is where I don't even remember my for, own card. For, for, for strike and vigilance. First strike and vigilance. There we go. But I yeah. remember that that uh, coming up with the right uh, a, a color pie solid collection of uh, abilities because I wanted one for each color. Right, that mm -hmm, was the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but initially, I made it uh, uh, have haste. For red, which and that didn't make sense in in retrospect because the as, of the a, aura as an aura the ah, thing has okay. haste already, so it didn't it did it was a useless mechanic uh, to put on something that was going to be an aura, and so that that had the most challenge in terms of uh, of finding the right combination. Uh, the easiest Ryan design was probably uh, temporal trespass. That mm -hmm. is. Uh, Blue, 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 eight, I believe. And it's take an extra turn after this one, delve. So it's a delve time walk. And I just remember being in a meeting where we were filling out some holes in this set. I'm not, I, that was even in a set that I wasn't even technically on the design team of. It's just that I was on Fate Reforged and we did a lot of work with the, uh, the, the Dragons team. Mm -hmm. I think that was a crossover, right? Wasn't I think it temporal. was in Fate Reforged? Yeah. Oh, it was in Fate Reforged. Okay, so it was just yeah. uh, anyway. So never mind. It was it was just a card from a set I was on. I thought I thought for some reason it was in Dragons. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we were just in a meeting and we were trying to come up with uh, splashy, rare delve, you know, uh, mythic or rare delve cards. Uh, maybe it was just mythic. And well, I just you know when you when I hear mythic, I just snap think of old powerful iconic mechanics and like making fixed versions of them. And I was just like, mm -hmm. what about delve time walk? And everybody laughed because like the thing with delve is the colorless stuff. The uh, the the it can be zero, right? So it's it, yeah. you know you can't make a literal you can't make a, a ten and a one time walk, right. <laughs> or else it could be a time walk for, for time one, walk. right? Yeah. So then I think it was Ben Hayes who kind of chuckled and said, yeah, maybe for you, you, you. And it's like, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, yeah. you, 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 delve time, time walk. Yeah. And, and like, then oh. put a big number next to it. Yeah. And like, <laughs> okay, that works. So it's a minimum of three. And, and anyway, so that was a kind of a snap design. Uh, 
uh, that that was kind of just felt natural. It's like, uh, duh, because yeah, you know, it's 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 basically me redesigning a card that's already designed. But it's like, uh, you know, when you describe a TV show as two different things, you know, to help somebody understand what it is. And it's like, uh, delve time walk. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, next question comes from Jay who says, hi guys, love your work. I consider us fortunate to be able to get content from Ryan again. Yeah, I agree with that, Jay. Uh, question one. <laughs> In fact, Jay kind of goes deep here. Uh, what does the future hold for Ryan Spain and going optimal? Any other plans other than the streaming? Uh, mm, other plan. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on a secondary market presence. I have a, uh, a I'm, I'm basically trying to support my fledgling streaming. Cause let me tell you, fledgling streaming is not the most lucrative thing in the world. I mean, if you can get big time in streaming, then you, then you're getting somewhere, but uh, I'm still, I got a long road ahead on that front. Um, mm -hmm. So something that's more lucrative in the, in the short term is me getting into the secondary market and, and using connections I've forged at wizards with uh, people who leave wizards and, and have collections that they want to move to, to basically get into the secondary market. That's very, maybe not so useful to listeners because it's not content uh, per se uh, content. Yeah, maybe, the, maybe it'll become content. Yeah, it could be. Um, but on the content front, I could see expanding my YouTube presence to be a little bit, uh, right now on, on YouTube, I'm just putting up, uh, cut up pieces of my streams in, in, you know, consumable chunks, but I think there's a lot more interesting content I could be doing on YouTube in terms of maybe, uh, if not a, you know, a video podcast, it, not, not something like a, as long as limited resources, but maybe a, a weekly arena check-in, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I'm playing with some ideas. But part of my going optimal philosophy that I take into life is knowing when to stop spinning that one plate and move on to another one because the value is greater at spinning that other plate. And I have I have basically my real goals are to improve the stream. There's a lot more that I want to do to make the stream itself a better experience. And that's kind of next on my list. But because... I'm achieving my baseline goal of showing up at the same time every day and producing what I think is quality content. I'm that those are the huge going optimal gains that I, that I got initially that I'm now kind of resting on a little bit while I make bigger gains elsewhere, which I think is kind of the key to going optimal at life. It's, it's figuring out where your biggest gains for the least work are and kind of triaging that way. So Okay. I'm going to continue to triage the quality of my stream, I guess, is, is mainly where I'm at. Uh, Jay also wants to know, any general thoughts about the increased complexity of limited magic of late? For example, war in general, the three ability planeswalker at uncommon in M20, etc. Those seem to be getting, the last few sets have been pretty complex, right? We've got the two kind of super gold sets and now war, you know, is the most complex of those three. War is super complex. I think the gold sets were actually simpler. There was really mm -hmm. only five for limited. There's only five color pairs that you're uh, considering during draft realistically. So that narrows down those options. And um, and then gold, while flashy and cool, doesn't necessarily mean complex. It just means this card does two colors worth of things. And so I, I didn't find those two to be complex, but I think War of the Spark is the most complex limited set they've made in years, if not over a decade. Like I, uh, I remember I kind of started in R and D as the fruition of New World Order was starting to make its way into sets. So for those <laughs> of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there it was really the set. Time, spir time spiral block is what slapped R&D across the face and said, you need to rethink this. Because at that point in time, uh, the time spiral block was a nostalgia set. It was time spiral specifically, especially, and to a lesser extent, planar chaos were aimed at existing players were aimed at people who remembered magic 10 years before yeah, and had you know, a lot those, of, those sets feel like modern horizons <laughs> yeah they feel like inside jokes and and then uh uh they got to um 
future sight and the wheels came off. It was so complex. It was one of the least new player friendly sets ever made. And this was on the heels. Was this ahead of and then like Lorwyn? Yeah, no, then Lorwyn comes out. Mm-hmm. And Lorwyn block is one of the most complex. Lim- like Lorwyn is probably the most complex limited set uh, we've since, you know, <laughs> like war is like a return to Lorwyn level complexity in some ways. Right. Um, a lot of onboard stuff. A lot of exactly. onboard stuff yeah. that makes you feel stupid when you miss it, you know, and that, and that was. Yeah. Uh, so it's been really interesting to see them to be in R&D through a period where they were really learning the lessons of Future Sight and of Lorwyn. And we're applying New World Order, which was the notion, it's a weird kind of oppressive sounding term or whatever, but all it means is pushing complexity out of common and into uncommon and especially rare. But that basically thinking, it's where they started thinking of like any random booster could be somebody's first magic booster that they open. And what would that experience be for them? And if you imagine like an Ice Age booster where the commons are as complicated as the rares, it's a nightmare. You know, it's why magic failed to connect with so much of its potential audience for so long. It was just not really listening to those lessons. So anyway, they um, they really started to get a rain on that and really started to apply New World Order while I was there and commons were getting less complicated and all that. But then I feel like I joked with Nick Davidson that uh, that War of the Spark just feels to me like R and D has the same willpower with New World World Order that I do with my diet, which is to say, <laughs> mostly pretty good. You know, I'm, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm keeping my weight down. I'm getting my exercise. I'm thinking about what I'm eating. But then something comes up, and I'm like, well, this is a special case. This. Mm. thing that's happening right now is a reason for me to throw this all out the window and just go hog. Right. So I feel Mm -hmm. like wizards does that sometimes and they, they uh, find the rationalization for throwing new world order out the window. And I think they did here and they might be right. Maybe it's worth it. Uh, It's funny how this war of the spark complexity, as I understand it is largely story driven like this, this format almost needed to be this complex because of where the, where creative was headed. Cause Doug, right. uh, I listened to Mark talk about how Doug Beyer was like, Hey, we're going to have this big planeswalker war as the culmination of our seven year arc or whatever. Right. You know, all the existing planeswalkers are going to come to Ravnica and duke it out. Right. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. But you got to represent that on cards. How do you do that? If, if you get a handful of planeswalkers per set, how do you, how do you present a war of planeswalkers in a set. Right. And you need the planeswalkers. You, <laughs> you need the planeswalkers. more of them. Yeah. And, and so then you're like, okay, well then we have to go all the way down to uncommon and rethink planeswalkers. And so I see how they got there, but the resulting complexity is bonkers. And I have to imagine there are some very sad new magic players who have bounced off the game who might've stuck in a different set. And that's an unfortunate cost to pay, but this is a really unique set. And the gameplay is largely very good. So I'm going to say, okay, as an experienced player, I'm fine with this. I'm worried about what you're doing to the newer players. And I'm worried about what you're doing to the, the psychology, the psyches of the, of the middling, not middling is a kind of weird word, like what just uh, intermediate limited players mm-hmm. who are, who are, who are working their way up and, and trying to feel like they're getting better. And then they get hit with this set. And a lot of people, either the new players are going to bounce off or low to intermediate level limited players are going to think they're much worse than they are. They're going to, they're going to feel down. Um, Cause they just don't get it or keep making mistakes keep or making feel the overwhelmed. Same, keep yeah. flying into creatures with reach, you know, that kind of stuff is really demoralizing. And so they're really taking a lot of risks on that front. But uh, let's give them a chance to swing the pendulum back the other way. I'm certainly going to take uh, War of the Spark over Triple Ixalan any day, right? So, um, and, and I think Triple Ixalan is them pushing the pendulum in the other in the other direction. I mean, I think I think Ixalan is a direct response to the complexity that people felt in uh, Ether Revolt and um, Kaladesh. Uh, Kaladesh, yeah. The, mm-hmm. I had some people say that that format felt like doing their taxes to them. It was just like (laughs) counters, counters, Uh, counters, put this, that tracking, yeah, yeah. fiddly tracking and everything. And so you see that R and D 
responds to things a lot like that. They'll a set will come out and they they'll push the pendulum back and sometimes they can overcorrect, you know. So sure. we'll see we'll see what kind of uh, correction there is for War of the Spark or if they're legit and they're just like, look, this is the only way we c- could come up with to design this payoff and we think it's worth it. Bear with us. M20 is coming, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, I'll say for my part, I enjoyed that. Like, I don't, you know, I don't mind some of that. Like it does feel like it's, it's in a better place in like modern horizons, which also has a lot of self-referential stuff. There's a lot of callback cards. There's a lot of cards that are based off of other things. And of course, just straight up reprints that'll make people happy. Yeah. It's and a perfect that's place a, for it. Yeah. I do think that that's where it should live. But that being said, you know, it's like you said with the diet, right? Like you got to have a cheat day, right? It's somebody's birthday, have a piece of cake, right? And, you know, I, I kind of appreciate that if they said, well, we're going to have to just kind of bite the bullet here and make this not quite as on plan as we we would prefer for War of the Spark, at least they just did it, right? Like they gave us like super cheap, efficient removal. They gave us all the planeswalkers and it was like, okay, we're just going to do it, right? And it, it's, it's kind of like going back to what we were talking about before. Like at least they took a shot, right? It, like yeah. they, at least they, and and I agree that it, it, it could be a little bit of a problem for newer players and stuff, but you know, there's also an enfranchised player group that matters, right? That that keeping them happy is a thing and throwing them a bone Every once in a while, with a with a set that that goes a little deeper, is okay too. I think I, I, as long as it's not, you know, every other set or even that often. I think you can you can be okay with taking one set to go a little little more hard, and then you know we're going to be back in M twenty and, and casting our two two flyer for three again in no time anyway. Yeah. Uh, one last question from Jay. He said, this is for me, actually. He says, uh, is there any chance of getting Ryan on for the sunset shows? I love Ryan's content, and getting to use his game designer brain there would be awesome. Probably not. Uh, you know, Luis does a good job on those. And plus, let's not forget, Luis is an excellent game designer himself. No kidding. Some, I, love his, about I, I love his game designer brain stuff. Yeah, it's great to hear different perspectives uh, on this stuff as well. But yeah, but Luis is a, is a you know professional game designer as well. So we'll probably keep it like that for now. Uh, next one comes from Farron, who says, Hi, Marshall and Ryan. Hope that Luis Voice of Hunger is recovered soon. <laughs> like I said, he is feeling better. So that's the good news. And I'm sure his voice will be back too. Two questions for Ryan. Ryan, have you ever been to Spain? I have not. Uh, my parents have. And it was... Uh... It was funny for them. There was a lot of explaining. No, no, we know where we are. We are. <laughs> this, this is. Uh, we know that that box is for last name, not uh, what country are you in. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> That's but, funny. Uh, yeah. No, I have. Not, I have not been. We were talking about traveling. My my family has been talking about traveling, and Spain came up as one of the possible places we would we could go. It sounds like a we would be really enjoyable. And I was uh, explaining to my to my daughter that. You know, you know, in Spain they call it España, <laughs> and she, mm-hmm. she like blew her mind. She's like, yeah, what? it's like, wait, what? <laughs> but in Spain, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, you should come. I'm I'm going there uh, next month sometime. Cool. Um, what's the other question from Fran was? Uh, what's the most valuable lesson you learned at Watsi? Wow, there's a lot of lessons I learned there. Um, mm-hmm. I think the most interesting design lesson I may have learned was actually when I learned pretty early from a presentation that Aaron Forsyth gave was actually like, yeah, it was uh, very early when maybe that's why it sticks in my head so much. It was one of those moments Mm -hmm. of like, holy crap, I am here. Like Mm -hmm. I am in a room where Aaron Forsyth is presenting a concept to Mark Rosewater, Eric Lauer, and me, you know, <laughs> like, and there's other people too, you know, but it's just like, how, uh, how did this happen, that is, right? That is great. <laughs> uh, but the concept was, uh, it was a, pro- a presentation he had called designing from the head versus designing from the heart. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it was kind of an early thing on top down versus bottom up mechanics, but also, um, the concept he delivered there that I hadn't thought through was what he called ownable versus resonant. That um, and his examples of ownable versus resonant, uh, the beholders in D and D are very ownable. Uh, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, the image immediately popped into your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't play D and D have no idea or, or aren't aware have no idea what a beholder. You know what a beholder is, uh-uh. Marsh. Yeah, no. so you don't. But those who do know that it's this big giant creature with a lot of stocky eyeball tentacles on it, you know? Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's a very D&D creature. 
it's an it's it's a it's a D and D property. It's a D and D intellectual property. They can own it. Nobody else out there can use beholders. They get beholders. Beholders is a D and D thing, right? Mm-hmm. And that's that has some power as well. That has some power. There's a, there's a marketing power. You can build around it. You can make it the 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 icon of your thing is the you know that that so that everybody who does play it knows it really well. The the opposite concept is something that is resonant. That is that people come into it with knowledge already. If I said Marshall, there's beholders in Magic, you'd be like, whatever. Okay, I don't even know what that means. But if I said right. Marshall, there's a strategy game called Magic. It's full of dragons. You'd be like, oh, I know dragons. They're I'm cool. in. I'm in. They're yeah, a cool fantasy yeah. property. And I like that. And that's resonant. So when you bring something that is, uh, you already had some information about it in your head that I, as a designer, can leverage towards you falling in love with my version of it, that's very powerful as well. Because I get a head start. Mm. I get a head start on convincing you that my thing is worthwhile because it already contains things you're familiar with. I see. However, it's hard to own a dragon. Um, Shivan dragon is pretty iconic, but dragons are everywhere. It's still just a dragon. Mm -hmm. You can't really own it as your own thing and make it the heart of your IP. Uh, although, you know, you look at Nicobolus and you see efforts to basically create ownable resonance, you know, I see that's uh, kind of a mix between the two. Right. How How do you get the best of both worlds and good creative is kind of your answer to that. But, uh, I'd never really thought of that distinction in my head before and that that had had a big impact on me as a designer that is great yeah Yeah. aaron obviously knows his stuff um andre hi marshall and ryan uh can you elaborate on what you look at when you evaluate how does this deck win when you draft since you can't know up front what the games will actually be like great question andre uh because i do this all the time and you even touched on this in the earlier segment there Rye about, you know, kind of setting expectations, but this is a little bit of a different angle on that in that it's not necessarily just if we think it'll do well or not, it's how, how does it play out, right? What is my Mm -hmm. plan? And this actually came up in a perfect scenario last night. Um, I was drafting Modern Horizons over at Adams and I was playing against my opponent. And after the match was over, he wanted to take a look at our decks and we had kind of laid things out. And, you know, I was able to show what my game plan was. And I also uh, did a video for CFB that, that'll go up of Modern Horizons on, uh, yeah, I know you're excited, Rocket, of um, uh, on Magic Online as well, where I had a totally different deck, but very much had a plan. And what I tend to do is there's cards that are really important to making to make a plan happen, right? And they usually happen at uh, certain points in the mana curve. So I'll usually say, for example, if I'm trying to play a long game control deck, like let's say I get lucky and I get a powerful rare like Future Sight, right? And that's the type of card that if it lands on the battlefield and you get to untap with it one or two times, usually you can generate enough advantage to have won the game from that point. And so the question is, can you survive? Can you survive long enough to either uh, have a high life total when you cast it so that you get a chance to untap with it or um, to find it, right? Because, you know, you, you might not draw it. And so you need to have some card draw spells or some ways to search it up or whatever. And I like to be able to look at it and say, okay, if I'm playing, for example, a control deck, I'll say, how do I not die to an early rush? Let's let's say my opponent goes one drop, two drop, three drop, or two dot, three drop, four drop. Am I dead? Like, do I have ways to interact? Are the cards that I'm going to be playing during that course of the game going to interact with the best draws from my opponent that I actually care about? Because the way that you should think about these game plans is you have to understand your matchups, right? And so, for example, using this to continue the example of using this control deck, what are the things I'm actually worried about? It's actually not another mid-range deck because my deck will then have the time to get its mana underneath it, cast my removal spells, cast my card draw spells, cast my good blockers and, and, you know, neutralizing effects. And I should be able to do fine. In fact, that's probably my best matchup because my deck is slightly slower than theirs. So I can be reactive, but then I'll have a more powerful late game. The deck I'm actually worried about is the one I mentioned a minute ago, which is that curve out style deck. So what's my plan? there? How does this deck beat the deck that I'm actually worried about playing? And then I'll look and say, well, 
I've made sure to keep my defensive speed good, meaning that I have a lot of cheap plays that interact with the board on some way, either block or kill a creature or whatever. So maybe that comes in the form of cheap removal spells, right? Which generally speaking, don't kill big creatures. But if you've got a plan for the big creatures later, then and you make sure that you cover the small creatures, then it usually ends up working out well. And I can start to now map out my plan. This also works in the reverse order where uh, I feel like my plan is weak. This happens all the time where I say, look, I know what my deck's trying to do. It wants to survive long enough to cast this six, seven mana bomb or whatever. But I didn't pick up any cheap removal spell. So if my opponent has one of those sort of quick early rushes, I'm not going to be able to interact with their board. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put some more two drops in, even if they're not very good. Right, I'm going to put some that you might not normally see in a control deck so that I have some way to interact with my opponent's early game. So I'm always trying to say, well, what is this deck actually trying to do? And one of the most interesting things that you find is, is that it's not always the same. A great example came up the other day with our friend Adam, where he had made um, a red-white sliver deck at a, at a live draft, and he had sent me a picture of it when he was done. And, and I was like, look... I know that you think that this is an aggro deck, right? Because that's how it normally goes with red, white and limited, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to play a bunch of early drops. I'm going to have pump spells and burn spells, and I'm going to just get my opponent dead as soon as possible. But this was a slivers deck, and it doesn't actually play out like that. This plays out in a way where if you can get critical mass of slivers on the battlefield, all of a sudden they're all getting first strike and plus two plus O and you've got four of them and your opponent won't be able to interact in combat. And yeah, it's nice if you curve into that, take those wins. That's, that's, that's great. But this deck can play a different way. And he ended up putting one or two copies of shelter in his deck. And it made me so proud because he told me about a play that he made when he was done, which was that he had the rare sliver that is red, white, one, one flying in haste that gives your other creatures uh, flying in your other slivers flying in haste mm -hmm. and he said he won the game because of it but the with the line he took was i could have played it and i waited until i had the mana to cast it and keep shelter up to protect it from a removal spell because he recognized that it wasn't about getting that creature on the battlefield and starting to hit his opponent with it it was about it surviving and giving all of his other slivers the ability to you know fly and get haste and that would win the game easily on its own and that's exactly what happened so he waited until he had four mana available cast it then protected it with shelter and then it won him the game from that point and that's not that doesn't line up with a normal game plan for like an all-out red white aggressive deck and that was something that you know i pointed out to him that he took to heart and actually was able to to employ in the game well, so it is a real skill right to figure out what your deck's trying to do totally and to ask yourself that question uh is important because if adam can can ask himself well how does this how does this deck actually win okay one of the ways it wins is it does curve out it is it does have aggressive stuff so it can just curve out and win but how do i win when that doesn't work and i get into a stall okay well this rare sliver is my most important card because it's going to get me out of that so I need to play towards, you know, what's, what is my plan? Again, it comes to what is your plan? My plan is to try mm -hmm. and get them dead before they can stabilize. But then if they stabilize, my plan is to find my destabilizer in the rare sliver. And because that's so important, I'm also going to seek to protect it. And exactly. One, and that's yes. how you pull, put together plans. And, you know, uh, I want to add to add to your comments in terms of, uh, Having asking those questions from throughout the whole draft, right? even from the beginning, you know, uh, how does this deck win? I mean, if your first uh, if your first pick is a card draw spell, if you pick a divination, pack one, pick one, or whatever, you don't have an answer yet. But you you start to have a feel. You already have a feeling. Well, divination is good in a lot of decks. It's best in decks that are trying to go long and leverage uh, ex basically the attrition war, winning the resource war. So the moment you've taken a divination, you're starting to head towards a path where winning is about winning an attrition war. So even from, from early picks, you can start to develop that plan, develop that sense of how your deck is going to win, and then start asking yourself as you're making picks, what, what job is that card doing? I love looking at picks and cards as having a job in a deck. And mm -hmm. so... Also, as you, get, as you get used to 
a format, you can start to even know what the jobs for a given archetype are. So like this, this came up a lot when we were drafting Dominaria on my stream in the last couple of weeks, um, because there's some very different ways to win in that format there. You know, I don't think there is reliable, but if you did do the white, red, you know, aggro, you're just trying to, you're trying to get in under before they mm -hmm. take over. Right. But my, like mm -hmm. my one word sentence for drafting Dominaria is, survive until you can recur value. Like that's, that's, yep. that's my yep. plan. Right. So if I know that that's the best strategy in the format, I'm going in already thinking, <clears throat> how does, how does the deck I'm about to draft win? Well, if I, if it's a good deck in this format, it's going to be one that survives until I can recur value. So at every pick, ask myself, what job is it doing given that plan? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, here's a uh, here's here's a, a Caligo Skin Witch. Well, hopefully at some point we recur the value of casting a spell that makes someone discard to. But it also has the role of survive, because if I desperately need to, I can play it on two as a one three to do some defense. So does mm -hmm. this do the job? Does this do some jobs towards surviving until I can recur value? Absolutely. Get in my deck. You know, then we mm -hmm. had a, a, a so I was drafting a, a, a blue black control deck that was doing exactly that. Survive till we can recur value and jousting lance comes up. And it's a, actually a pretty weak pack. It's like there's not a lot of great stuff in there. And many people in my chat were uh, saying, Jousting Lance, it's, you know, why, you're not even talking about it. And so I stopped to talk mm -hmm. about it. And it's like, what's, what's its job? Explain to right. me what the job of this card is in our deck. Right, right. <laughs> like, uh, we're trying to survive until we recur value. At what, what part of what is this doing to, to, to make mm -hmm. that plan happen? And when you nothing. look at it that way, you realize, oh, nothing. This is good against us. If we were if we were in uh, drafting in pod, it was such a weak pack. I might have taken it just so that we didn't have to face it. Mm -hmm. But uh, given that we were on arena, it was like, no, we're going to take anything that we might play because I am never, literally, never running this card in my deck because it is a liability. If I right. draw it early, it is not helping me survive, and if I'm drawing late, it is not helping me recur value. It's just increasing the quality of one of my threats, which I don't need. The deck just does not need that. So yeah. uh, making sure you're asking your, uh, yourself that question, how does this deck win? And, and uh, as you're forming that answer, it starts to define your strategy, which defines what kind of jobs you need for your deck. And then you can start saying, oh, I am in a blue-black control deck. How does this deck win? Oh, my God. The only thing mm -hmm. I have right now is one, three, four flyer. Okay, yeah. that's not enough. So now if, I need if to, they kill this, I can't win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I need to prioritize. I need something else in the air. Uh, I need to add some flyers to this deck. I need to add uh, probably some extra flyers and probably some a soul salvage or two so that I can recur value and make sure. It, and it starts to dictate how you approach future future picks. So yes, just yeah. keep asking yeah. yourself that question. During the draft, during the, and that's all about making your plan during the game as well. Well, how am I going to win from here? I mean, uh, there's been mm -hmm. so many depressing uh, kicks to the head that you take in a in a game of Magic that you feel like have completely deflated all of your chances for winning. That just uber crushing moment. Well, stand up and ask yourself, how does this deck win from here? How do I win from here? The answer might be I can't. You know, I've come to that conclusion yeah. on stream before. It's like, wow, folks, we have zero outs. <laughs> yeah. We are yeah. we are just going to lose this. I've said that when my opponent was at one before. I was like, yep. sorry, folks, we're going to lose this. And it's like 31 to one. And like, what are you talking about? It's like, no, mm -hmm. I can see the rest of my deck. I literally have nothing to get through their stall. And we're going to yep. deck. <laughs> we're just yep. going to deck. And then it totally. happens. And they're like, what? It's like, yeah. Yeah. But at least yeah. you know, right? And if you if you look at that list and you know what's left, you can define a plan that answers the question: How does this deck win? Yeah, uh, you know this this came up for me as well with the um, the gates deck in not, not actually in uh, RNA but in GRN, and th there was that one equipment that made your creature bigger for each gate you control. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, I was drafting the gates deck, and I had tons of gates, and I you know I didn't want that card even though we opened it and i just got just lambasted by chat and i was just like no like this card is irrelevant this is not how we win you know and there's things that could change my mind for example if i had had a few lifelinkers i might consider it because just one hit with an eight powered lifelinker is actually 
you know, quite good. Or rats and keeping cats. you alive. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and I would play it in that deck, but that wasn't what this deck was. Right. You know, th- this was the pure gates deck. In and the, the rats deck and cats deck, it has a very it. specific job. What's the job mm-hmm. of that card? Turn irrelevant creatures into relevant game-winning threats. Yep. And that, and that there's your inevitability. So yeah, I love that. What's what's your job? What's your what's each card in your deck? What's its job? And uh, some of them are easier to right. Like some of them are just very straightforward. It's like it's a removal spell. Its job is to kill creatures so that I can either get them out of the way to attack or you know survive longer or whatever. And they just sort of are always good. But there's a lot of cards that are not uh, that don't fit that description. It's definitely worth the thought. Yeah. Um, Gar says uh, we ended up. Uh, we end up playing a lot of sealed, not preferred, but just how the ball bounces with our schedules. You guys skip sealed show for RNA and haven't done one for war. Is that deliberate and oversight? Can we get them earlier in the format so more time to process and make use of it? Or are they off the docket because people don't play as much sealed as they do draft? Um, no, that, that, so the deal with that is, is that sometimes it gets a little bit lost in the fray because things like, like modern horizons come out and kind of dominate the conversation for a while. And we like to try to get the sealed out as it lines up the best we can with, with bigger tournaments. Um, we do recognize, of course, that people play, um, you know, local, local level events that are sometimes sealed as well, but that, that we are not killing sealed we still feel that it's important to talk about the differences because while you know if if you draft the format a lot you're going to have a good knowledge of the format there are enough things in most sealed formats that change it are and that's why we we do those shows um but no that was not intentional and we won't be uh we should be doing one for war as well i'll talk to to luis about that um Michael says, hello, Ryan. Uh, is there a card you regret designing because maybe there was some unwanted interactions or it played worse than expected? Or is there a card maybe that turned out better than you expected it to? No regrets. I have Again, I don't have enough cards to really have regrets of like, oh, I broke a format or, you know, it wasn't that good. The, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, Chromanticore, which I described earlier, it's uh, the foil version is, is worth a a decent amount because it's a somewhat of a commander staple for five color decks now. So that makes, fills me with a warm fuzzy. Uh, hmm. It would have been nice if temporal trespass had, had been a little more playable. The, the eight colorless really put a pressure, you know, they, they really wanted to make sure that card wasn't busted, unfortunately. <laughs> so they, they gave it and I get it because when a card like that is busted, it's pretty boring. I mean, take a look at uh, the, the extra turn, thing that was dominating they had to ban it from arena best of one you don't want best you don't want busted time walks it doesn't make for the best uh play environment so i don't mind that that one wasn't busted and i really i'm i think my favorite card that i designed though was the first eruption it's not even that powerful it's just a great top-down design if i can uh call my own design great but it's nice that like i've heard that uh even after i left r&d it was being held up as an example of how sagas can successfully deliver a nice three chapter story. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and it's really neat to me that I have a card, that, a rare card that I designed on the cool frame of the set. You know, the, it was the, yeah, the, yeah. Like, it's not just some the random card artwork. It, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's got neat artwork and stuff. And I love that it's cheap. I'm buying up the foils left and right. They're so, they're, you know, so I have a, <laughs> That's I great. Bunch, I have a bunch of foils of uh, the the first eruption that I that I feel like I can use as also, you know uh, trinkets and handouts and that kind. Of, anyway, so it's it, there's there's something to great. be said about a card you're proud of actually being uh, a bulk rare. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is great. <laughs> uh, next question comes from Janusz who says, "Hey Ryan, I just wanted to say that uh, I joined in the LSV era. I started listening from his first show, but I have to admit I really enjoyed your designer hat observations in Modern Horizon set primer. Well done. Uh, Follow up question. So, where does your surname come from? Sounds quite specifically linked to a country. Is there a story behind it?" Uh, more, more questions about Spain. Not really, there's yeah. not really a lot known We're I'm Northern European mutt. And the best guess about that kind of thing is that someone not Spanish spent a significant amount of time in Spain and then became known in their own, you know, circles as that guy of Spain, you know, that, that mm-hmm. somebody of Spain became just Spain at some point. But I know uh, I do notice 
it, you, it's hard to have a country for a last name and not notice it when you see it elsewhere. So you know, I, when I've noticed, mm-hmm. I noticed some, some France's and some Portugal's and, uh, oh, yeah, uh, that's England's, funny. you know, there, there's, mm-hmm. you could have a whole, uh, team, a whole basketball team of nations. My, my last name is very English and, uh, I got one of those genetic things for, for Christmas a couple of years ago for my mom. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's funny. I, I looked it up and it was like, you know, m- most of my heritage is, you know, European, whatever, Northern European, whatever it is, right. Middle European. And I, that's kind of what I expected. And, uh, they did an update. Like it was like a year later. They're like, well, you know, because of course the way these work is the more people that do it, the more they can contextualize your DNA within a framework. Uh So they're like, well, we're more accurate now. (laughs) And it was like, it bumped me from being like 15% from England to like 50. (laughs) It's like, no, you're really, really English now. (laughs) So I'm like, all right, well, I guess that that is what it is. I think Um, that goes with Sutcliffe pretty well. Yeah, it does. Uh, Crush Castle says, uh, how did being an R&D change how you evaluate cards and how you play Magic, not including the limits that Watsy puts on R&D members for uh, playing outside of work? Um, how I evaluate cards, uh, let's see. I mean, do you just automatically see them as designs now rather than, you know, cards? Was that always the case? Because, like, for me, when when I'm presented with a card, I – you know, it isn't until we get into the set review or we I start to see it in context with other cards that I start to even consider how it was designed, why, whatever. I, you know, I, it, my first glance is just face value. I don't go, oh, I see what you did there, designer. That was tricky. I don't even think a human being made it. I just think that this card always existed and it's just I've now seen it. <laughs> you yeah, know? There's like, a, I think you've hit on something there. Definitely seeing stuff change from the inside was really interesting. Because it was easy for me to fall in love with cards in the design file as they were and then see them change and be sad or whatever. Um, but I think one of the one of the ways that I've changed how I evaluate cards is their their quality as a limited environment edition. Uh, I remember an early conversation I had with Eric Lauer about how disappointed I was with uh, the inclusion of the filter, some filter land, the, the, the common taps for color, taps for colorless or, uh, one tap add, you know, anything, right. So that, that for one extra, mm-hmm. you can, you know, unknown shores, that cut type of card. Mm-hmm. And it just feels, it felt so bad to me that I was kind of offended that it was even in the set. And, uh, Eric explained to me, <laughs> I like this take by the way. Yeah. It's just like, well, yeah. who, cause like it's just ah, it could be better. You're, you're, There's you're such trying to better trick. fixing. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like why why wouldn't you include a better fixer in that spot? That that's what I wanted. It's like it's so low powered. I just wanted it to be a better card. He said, "Well, the role here, the the job, <laughs> the job of this mm-hmm. card in this set is to allow players who may be splashing. Uh, oh, this was in a set with I think uh, off colored." Uh, flashback. So maybe it was Innistrad or something, mm-hmm. something like that. Off-colored flashback. And he was saying it was so that someone who ended up with uh, a deck that was trying to leverage the power of late game flashback in the graveyard had a way to splash different, you know, had a five-color splasher where it didn't even really matter you were adding another one because this was for your late game stuff anyway. And, mm-hmm. and this was the critical the aha moment for me, and I don't want other people to draft it, is what he said. You know, like mm. I, I, I don't. I mm. want this to be there for the players who need that ability. And if mm-hmm. we put in a better fixer, you're going to take it and make three color decks that we didn't didn't intend and don't want in the format to be good at least. And this still gives the tool that I'm looking for that archetype pilot to have. And that was a big aha moment for me where it was like, Oh, it's not more, just- more focused, more, more of a, a targeted strike yeah. rather than just sort of it existing deliberately, anymore. not bad, but deliberately narrow, deliberately narrow. So it would make it to the people who want it. That was a, 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 a thing that changed the way I evaluate cards in a set for sure. Yeah. All right. We've got time for a couple more questions here. Uh, this first one, very important for you, Ryan, is from Peter, who says, Ryan's back again. Good stuff. My important question is, 
What is the coffee break room set up like at Wizards? I'm sure there's some cars were designed uh, that were designed with a fair bit of caffeine having been consumed. Love the show. We'll be listening on my commute in rainy England. Hey, it's my my ancestor Peter here uh, chiming in. So you're a big coffee guy. Yeah, I ro- uh, roast my own coffee. In fact, the uh, the the coffee set up in R and D and in on the arena team when I was there was was from me. <laughs> I, and <laughs> you set it up well. I, I do this to myself, but basically when it be, you know, it became known, I was telling people that I was roasting coffee and it was delicious. And then I was like, Sean Main was like, oh, that sounds great. I'd love to try that sometime. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll bring it in sometime. And then I, I brought in some coffee and uh, brewed it at my desk in a, in a um, fancy brew style. Anyway, and then... And, every, and people loved it. And then because I'm a sucker for people loving things, I started making it a regular thing. And I created a coffee station next to my desk and had a had a box uh, that um, was just a modified <laughs> cardboard box with this with a sign on it that basically said, you know, coffee. I, I'd buy any of my coworkers a cup of coffee. Right. Right. But people want to um, pay back. So it was just like put in uh, 70, you know, 50 cents. Uh, it was like 50 cents a cup. Or mm-hmm. a booster pack. If you, mm-hmm. so you could put a booster pack and or fifty cents in, and you could come and get uh, a incredible fresh coffee, but really good from, stuff, right? Right I from mean, my desk. Yeah. yeah, and then I brought that down to the arena team as well. So, <laughs> so that's what it was like when you were there. So yeah. they're on their own now. Back they're to on the, their own. Back to the junk now. Um, all right, let's do one more question here. Uh, this one. It comes from Josh, who says, hey, Ryan, what a treat it is to have you back for two straight weeks. Are there lessons or heuristics and frameworks from the early days of LR that you think have changed in validity with modern limited sets? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Because we are coming up on 10 years here, and yeah, they have changed how they design. coming right up. Yeah, 500 is coming up in a month, and then in, I think it's August or October or something. September. Uh, September. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, the 10 year anniversary of the show. Um, but that's a, that's a great observation because we know that they've changed the way that they design sets and we've had to make adjustments on the show, uh, you know, based on how we recommend things and, and how we approach things because of those changes in that time frame. But this is even a little bigger picture, right? He's talking yes. about the heuristics and frameworks that we put into place way back when we started the show. Um, is there anything that's changed? Uh, there, there, you know, are they, are they pretty uh, time proof? I'm what? really proud of how our content has held up. It's not like I go back and listen a lot, but occasionally I have gone and listened because mm-hmm. like Adam went back and listened to some older episodes and he was mentioning them to me at one point, And I was like, out of curiosity, I went and listened and mm-hmm. I was ready to just get into fights with my past self. I had my fists practically up like, come on, Ryan, I'm gonna sh- <laughs> let's see how dumb old Ryan is. I bet. And then it was like, no, he keeps saying things I agree with, I guess, you know, <laughs> so I'm, I am quite proud of how the content has held up because we've always tried to provide a framework from which you can assess any new magic set, you know, that because uh, part of our whole spiel is that sets are, you know, independent and you need to get context and nothing is in a vacuum. And is it two, two for two good here or bad here? Is divination good here or bad here? You know, these are questions that because we're so focused on taking a look at each individual set and understanding how it ticks and understanding the context for that set, I think the tools we have laid out have been pretty darn good for continuing that process. And like things like the vanilla test, that's why I was like, it's never about passing or failing the vanilla test on some grand arbitrary scale, like that, that somehow three, three, four, uh, four is somehow passing or fail. There, there is no pass or fail in the abstract. There is only in the context of that format. Right. Right. And right. so because we've focused so much on bending your heuristics to fit the reality of the format you're in, I think everything holds up pretty well. The one yeah. one place that I think I would say I've shifted my opinion on is the role of counterspells in Limited, which is to say, mm-hmm. and I think part of this has to do with the quality of removal and how that has changed. In a world where all of the common removal is as powerful as it has been in, say, War of the Spark, counterspells are 
I think, less good because you would rather just have these sure things that if you draw them after the fact still work. You know, that's a big thing that like that's the big point that I that old Ryan always hammered on with counter spells is they're reactive. They do not answer a problem off the top of your deck. And I was really anti counter spells throughout most of my limited resources run. And I play them quite a bit now in the right places and in the right decks. Like in Dominaria, for example, I was playing Unwind uh, because that format created a situation where I found the most important stuff I was battling over at that end stage, at that recur value, was my opponents trying to recur value <laughs> or, or stop me mm -hmm. from doing it. And so suddenly countering a non-creature spell, even for three mana, was was worth it to me in in that context and i think if the removal were better that may be less the case but just i'd say the role of counter spells and how to use them in a in a control deck going long is a, a thing i've shifted on from my early lr days probably you yeah. know what i'll do uh, i'll put a i actually wrote an article about this um four or five years now ago um about talking about how the removal changed. It's called Doomblade Days. This was uh, when uh, limited information was still a weekly column. And uh, I actually went pretty deep on that one. Um, this was around the time of Cons of Tarkir. And I actually uh, did like a little bit of a study on how the removal had changed, um, even in the time since I had started playing. So uh, I'm looking at it right now and I'll put a link in the notes. But just one of the examples I did was following Doomblade, which in M10 was a common and then in M11 and M11 and M12, it was also a common. And then in M13, it became murder, right? Which is one black, black destroy target creature rather than the restriction, but obviously not splashable and a lot harder to cast. And then in M14, it was liturgy of blood, three black, black for a sorcery, <laughs> destroy target creature, add three black mana to your mana pool. Um, and then in M15, it was flesh to dust, which is three black, black instant destroy target creature. It can't be regenerated, right? So we saw this huge shift, right? From two mana common instant speed, relatively unconditional to five mana sorcery or sometimes instant speed um, removal. And there were similar trends as well with the red removal and the cheaper black removal with a card like Grasp of Darkness, black, black turret creature gets minus four, minus four until end of turn at instant becoming Throttle or Lash of the Whip, which is the exact same card as Grasp of Darkness. Both of those are, except for they're four and a black instead of black, black. And that was when things changed, right? And so what I did in the article was try to highlight some of the other types of cards that you could use to shore up your defenses. And I think that one that I don't even know if I mentioned it in the article, but definitely agree with you on are counter spells. They just, they have gotten uh, more of a necessary evil before you, you had the luxury of not needing to play them. And now there's something that you should consider, uh, you know, more highly, especially any counter spell for two mana that can counter a creature, you know, essence scatter, that type of card ends up being uh, quite Yeah. Good. That's why syncopate is my, uh, I will play mm -hmm. any number of these in Dominaria draft because it's a two drop, you know, it's a, mm -hmm. and, and people are using their mana so much and so late in that format that it's also yeah. a 10 drop, you know, that's right. All right. Well, let's call it there. Um, I've got to get going here. Uh, unfortunately, we had quite a few questions that we didn't get to ask. Um, I'll try to save these for later though. Um, and I really appreciate everybody who did uh, answer a question here, or excuse me, ask a question here. Come on stream and ask Ryan. me and I'll answer it there. Yeah, there you go. That's a great place to do it. So why don't you let people know where they can find it? And then also I will mention once again that I will have a link in the show notes for your stream as well as that draft video um, on your YouTube channel that we mentioned. And I'll put one in for this article too, but just uh, remind people where they can find you again. Yeah, my stream is twitch TV slash going optimal. And you can find me at Ryan Spain on Twitter and YouTube. I have a YouTube presence. I would just recommend Googling going optimal YouTube and you'll find it. But I also, I think Marsh has a link for that too. We can throw, throw in the notes, but yeah. And Twitter, YouTube and Twitch. That's where you're going to find me most. Ryan underscore Espana. Is that? No, just uh Ryan Spain. All one word. <laughs> Careful. Okay. <now. laughs> uh, uh, you can find me on social media, Marshall underscore L R. Uh, and you can find everything related to the podcast at lrcast.com. Also, 
Uh, I want to mention our sponsor on wartime channel, fireball.com. If you've got cards that you need to sell, right? If you've got that pile of rares that's just sitting on your desk, not doing anything, you can sell them back to channel fireball. And if you want store credit, say for a box of modern horizons or, or the spark or something like that, uh, you'll get a 30% bonus on that trade in, which is a great deal. Um, kind of keeps that, you know, we were talking earlier with Ryan about trying to maximize the economy on arena so you can draft as much as you can for the least amount. Well, when it comes to live magic, look, it's not, it's not cheap, right? These boxes cost a lot of money. And one way you can help offset those costs is by clearing off some space on your desk and getting rid of those old cards that you've got. You can look up the prices ahead of time. So you'll know exactly what you're getting. You send them in, they'll grade them, get you that credit. Or if you want, you can just get money as well for the straight up price. So either way, channelfireball.com for that. That's going to do it for this week. Um, next week, I will be in Las Vegas for the Mythic Championship 3, the first arena one. And Luis should be there too. So we'll be doing the show from Vegas. We'll see you then. You know, I uh, I don't even know if I ever mentioned this in my entire run on the show before. I, ha- I feel like I had to have because it's such an important part of my childhood and my history. But if I haven't, I would I was going to tell listeners that uh, I lived in India for two years in, when I was in mm-hmm. middle school. It was a, mm-hmm. one of the most formative times of my life. Uh, to this day, the most valuable thing Facebook has ever done for me is reconnect me with the uh, my my classmates from fifth, sixth or from sixth and seventh grade, which is when I was in was, was there. Uh, it was a really unique time in my life, but it, I was reminded of a, of a story from there, from that trip recently, because, uh, I, so I read, had read about, uh, holy celebrations, H O L I holy is a, uh, I don't know if it's Indian specific or if it's based on, uh, you know, it has a religious basis specifically, but I know that it, Nepal and India celebrate holy, which is like a, a festival of colors a celebration Mm -hmm. of color. And we were traveling in Kathmandu, Nepal. My parents were big travelers, obviously, because we decided to live in India for two years. But also within that trip, we traveled all around that region almost every weekend going to someplace new and interesting. And I had uh, just gotten a new i was trying some of the, some more local local clothes and i had a mm-hmm. a very indian top it was a a white linen shirt and a, a set of matching kind of linen pants it was very summery and light and and i was mm-hmm. feeling pretty stylish and 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 cool in it and and very local you know and mm-hmm. uh, blending in yeah. blending in sure and we just we decided to go out around uh around Kathmandu during holi Anybody who knows, some people out there probably know where this is going. <laughs> but holy is a celebration of color, and it involves a lot of throwing of dye and water balloons <laughs> and colored <laughs> balloons at each other and people. And basically, oh, no. <laughs> if you wear white, if you wear white during holy in Nepal or India, you have worn a target. <laughs> and I, to this oh, day, in fact, no. I need to go and ask my mom, did you know, did you know what was going to happen to me that day? And you just uh-huh. let it happen? Or were you surprised too? Uh-huh. I'm not sure. Did you get pelted? I'm not sure what? when the first water balloon hit me, but it was probably <laughs> within 30 <laughs> seconds of getting out of our cab or whatever and walking oh, around, no. <laughs> walking around. Uh, Kathmandu, <laughs> and it just went on and on and on. And, oh my god! Um, I just started. I just embraced it. At first, I was, you know, I was a twelve-year-old, indign- indignant, angry twelve-year-old who could not believe that complete strangers were hurling balloons at me and mm-hmm. staining my cool new clothes. When, right. when all of them thought, oh, there's someone who's getting into the spirit of holy and is giving us a canvas. Like, it just, <laughs> like, I don't blame a single person who threw a balloon at me because that's the point of the day. Like, that's the, yeah. I, that was yeah. just the point of the day. And it absolutely looked like I was simply participating in it. 
but it was quite a rude awakening to think that you were styling in your local threads only to spend the next two and a half hours getting pelted by dye-filled water balloons. So it was quite a tie-dye outfit by the end of that day. (laughs) 